Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can use the chapter links at the bottom of the playback screen. If you'd like to speed up or slow down the video, use the gear at the bottom of the playback screen to change the playback speed. In this week's video, I have tidbits, and I'll talk about an interesting chart challenge I faced while knitting my latest project. So let's get started. First though, I'd like to thank all of you who offered condolences on the death of my mother. I truly appreciate it. Even more, I'm thankful for how many of you shared in the comments your own experiences managing grief or stress and how your knitting shifted during or after those stressful times and how it shifted again on the other side of it. For anyone facing a similarly difficult time, you may find it really helpful or cathartic to read through those comments in that video. I'll leave a link down in the show notes. So I'm not sure if I have shared this particular tidbit with you before. I know that I have seen this film that I'm going to share with you. Uh, I had seen it probably a couple of years ago, so if I have shared it, it's probably been a while. It's a short animated film from Pixar Studios, and it's about a ball of yarn named Pearl, who starts her first day of work at a company with a lot of finance bros, and it's about her journey to change the company culture. Uh, I really found it entertaining and uh, I think you will too. So I will leave a link to that little animated film down in the show notes. This tidbit came to me in my Twitter feed. I follow quite a few people on Twitter who are fashion historians or who study material culture. And one of those people is Alden O'Brien. So sometime in the past couple of weeks, she shared some photographs of a sewing book that was created by an Irish school girl back in 1831. And what Alden said about it was that she had never seen anything like it that showed that range of, of needlework in, contained in one book. Included in the book were four embroidery samplers, uh, wool patchwork, white work embroidery, as well as knitting and sewing. Within Alden's tweet, she had several additional messages and each one of those uh, tweets included several photographs of what was inside that book. From what I understand, this book is uh, going up for auction and the seller is hoping that a museum will buy it, but it's really an extraordinary book. So I'm going to leave a link down and you can see Alden's uh, thread of tweets regarding this little sewing book. Inside the book, it, there's an embroidered title page that says, the following specimens of needlework were executed in the female model school, Kildare Place, Dublin, by Christiana Norwood. So I hope you enjoyed it. I really had a great time looking at all of the, the needlework, including the tiny little miniature items of clothing. This tidbit was sent to me several times from different people over the past uh, month or so. And it's an article about a book that was published, I think in early May, by the National Library of Australia. The book is called Vintage Knits and it contains vintage sweater patterns that had been published in newspapers in Australia in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. So the book contains a lot of vintage material, some of the original material that would have been published in the newspapers, but the patterns themselves have been updated with information that's helpful to the modern knitter. So newspapers often published knitting patterns. Uh, in fact, my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s began when I wondered if knitting patterns had been published in newspapers in the 19th century and early 20th century. I knew they had been published later, but here in the U.S., most newspapers, this doesn't 
not including the big city papers, but most newspapers were like county newspapers that were published once a week, and they would have only had maybe eight pages to them. So there wouldn't have been a lot of room to publish something like a knitting pattern. So when I did that initial search, I found a lady's sweater pattern that was published in a 1906 issue of the Boston Globe, and it was that sweater pattern that started my journey of knitting my way through the 20th century. So Australia has a database of digitized newspapers and magazines that is called Trove. So it's a website called Trove and it's got all kinds of things on there. And lots of knitters, including me, use this database uh, to search for vintage knitting patterns. One of the struggles that knitters can face when they're knitting from a vintage pattern, and I have certainly faced the struggle uh, many times, is that the yarns called for in the pattern are no longer available. Not only are they discontinued, you have to try to figure out what kind of yarn it was. Like what was the yarn weight? What was the construction? What, what kind of yarn was this? And then what would be a good substitute nowadays? Another problem is that patterns published prior to about 1950 were published in only one size and the information that we would deem essential these days like gauge and finished measurements wasn't always provided. The patterns in this book have been updated to include recommendations for modern yarns as well as multiple sizes and the instructions have been tweaked a little bit to be more like what people today are used to reading as well. So what I'll do is I'll leave a link to the article that I was telling you about down in the show notes, but I'll also leave a link to Trove, which is this database of newspapers and magazines um, so that you can play around and see what you might be able to find as well. This tidbit was sent to me directly and I cannot for the life of me find the original message and give credit to the person who sent the link to me. It is a link to a song that's on YouTube uh, and it's called Stick to Your Knittin' Kitten by the Four Vagabonds. The song was published in 1942, which would have been during World War II. The lyrics of the song is a man singing to his, uh, I presume his girlfriend or maybe it's his wife, and he's telling her to stick to her knitting kitten he's going off to work he doesn't say off to war he says he's going off to work so it could be that he is going into the military and he's telling her he can't wait to see her again and can't wait to wear the sweater and the mittens and whatever else she might be knitting for him. The first time I heard that expression stick to your knitting was I think just a couple of years ago and it was in a blog post. I can't remember who posted it, but they talked about that, that phrase and how it's a sexist phrase because traditionally in the past couple hundred years anyway, it's been women mostly who have done the knitting and so if you're telling somebody to stick to their knitting uh, which means stick to what you know that there's this implication of sexism because you would probably only say that to a woman but it turns out that this is a pretty common phrase in business a similar phrase goes all the way back to like roman or greek times when translated the the phrase was the cobbler should stick to his last the last is the, the foot form that the shoes are constructed around with the same idea that you should stick to what you know and keep your nose out of, of, of something that you don't know. The phrase has gotten a little more charged recently and apparently there was even a kerfuffle in the New Zealand parliament when a male member of parliament said that to a female member, stick to your knitting. And there was a, a big, a discussion about whether he was being sexist or not. So I'm going to leave links to the song by the Vagabonds, but also I will leave a, a link to the New Zealand Public Radio uh, discussion with a linguist about the origins of this phrase and whether or not it's it um, maybe shouldn't be used anymore. And I'd like to know if you guys have heard this phrase before and if it had sexist undertones to you, if it's always had that, or if only recently, or if you've been pretty neutral about it. Let me know down, down in the comments. 
This last tidbit showed up in my Twitter feed. It was posted by the Center for Knitting and Crochet. They posted this painting. I just love paintings that depict people knitting in some way, and I don't believe I've ever seen one that showed somebody using a Swift. So this painting is called Una Madre, and it's by Silvestro Lega, who was an Italian painter, and apparently this painting was made in 1884. It's held in a private collection, so I don't have a link to a museum where you might be able to learn more about it, but I will leave you a link down in the show notes to the Wikipedia article about the artist. One of the things that I love about this painting is not just that she's winding yarn and using a swift, but that her little kid who's standing behind her is standing on the train of her dress. She's not going to be able to move very far until that kiddo gets off of her uh, dress, that's for sure. Last week I was showing you a little baby cardigan that I started knitting the day after my mother died. I really needed to knit, but I didn't want to work on a current work in progress because I just didn't want to associate those feelings with something I was going to be really excited to wear in the future. So I decided to knit something small, baby cardigan, for my college roommate that's going to have her first grandbaby this fall and it's going to be a little girl and so I decided to knit a cardigan for the baby. So I did finish the knitting. I have a couple of ends to weave in and I need to sew on the buttons. I bought some buttons and when we go to the overhead I'll show you the buttons I bought. I like the buttons. I th just think they're not quite right for this sweater. They'd be great for a different sweater, just I don't think this one. What I want to do is go to the overhead. I want to tell you a little bit about this particular project, um, some choices I made for techniques. In just about every knitting pattern, you always have a choice. Like they might tell you to cast on 98 stitches. They won't tell you what cast on to use or sometimes they will tell you what cast on to use and you might not like that cast on and you want to use a different one. So I want to uh, show you like the decisions that I made in this sweater and why I made those and places where I made changes and, and that sort of thing. And then I want to talk a little bit about the chart. I love knitting charts. I will rechart a pattern that is already charted in the software that I have in order to use the symbol set that I'm most familiar with, but also so that I can repeat multiples and repeats. And if I'm using more than one stitch pattern, I can put them all in one big chart. It just makes it, uh, that makes it a little bit easier for me. So there are a couple of things about this chart that puzzled me at first. And so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, why I was puzzled and, and then some decisions I made about uh, how to interpret the chart in a way uh, that was going to give me results that I like, even if those aren't the results that the designer intended. So here is the cardigan. This pattern is called Dahlia. It is by Lainetz, and I believe it comes in a lot of different languages. The designer is from somewhere in Europe, but there's an English language pattern. So there's actually four different garments within the pattern. All of them have this sort of leaf pattern. The, the project is called Dahlia because these are meant to represent the petals of a of Dahlia flower. Uh, I would consider this a, a classic sort of leaf pattern. All of four of the, pa of the projects are knit top down with a seamless yoke construction. The yoke is knit flat for all of them. So for the cardigan, you're knitting, you have the opening going all the way down the front. The three other patterns are a little short sleeve pullover sweater, uh, and there's a dress, and then there's also a little romper that snaps at the crotch. And all three of those have an opening at the back with one a one button closure. So again, for all of them, you're working the yoke flat. There is a chart for the Dahlia pattern as well. Now I don't know if this is true for all of the the projects but the cardigan comes in five different sizes and in addition you can get the pattern for this sweater the cardigan in a separate 
pattern that's for larger kid sizes. So I, like for ages three or four on up, you can get a pattern that's for this cardigan, but in larger sizes. I often will use a long tail cast on as my sort of go-to cast on when I need an edge. But anytime I'm going to be knitting in knit one, purl one ribbing, I like to use what's called an alternating cast on. So I uh, cast on in this direction. You can see as, as you turn the cast on over, the stitch pattern just rolls from one side to another. So there's no edge that looks different that separates the, the, the front from the back at the edge. It just rolls around. So there's another type of cast on called a tubular cast on that looks very similar to this. Some people will call the tubular cast on an Italian cast on is something they're calling that lately. This is a different type of cast on. A tubular or Italian cast on typically has a couple of rows of double knitting to create literally a tube, sort of a, a, a fatter, rounder uh, roll edge. And so this edge is flatter than that. So this is what I would call, I have always called or known as an alternating cast on. And I have done a video on this, which I will link to above and down in the show notes. And then for the bind off, I have a matching bind off that gives the same, uh, same sort of edge. And this is an edge I call a grafted bind off. And again, a lot of people will call this an Italian bind off or, or it's a type of sewn bind off. And if you are doing a tubular bind off after you've done a couple of rows of double knitting, then you would do this sewn bind off. So there are a lot, there's th probably three different kinds of, of sewn bind offs, but this is one that you can use with knit one purl one ribbing and you can get that flipped over edge. And again, I've got a video on that. So a third thing that I chose to do, and this is something I, I chose to do differently than what the pattern stated, this has buttonholes in it and the pattern called for working uh, a two stitches of a bind off. So you'd bind off two stitches and then on the next row when you came back, you'd cast on two stitches over that. And I prefer to have my buttonholes hide in a column of purl stitches if I'm doing a knit one purl one ribbing. So I did what's called a three row buttonhole again have that <laughs> technique. Uh, I'll put that up here, but also down in the show notes. So these, these buttonholes are a little bit stretched out because I was trying, trying them over different types of buttons. Let me show you the buttons that I was looking at. I liked, because of this little leaf pattern, I liked these little ladybug buttons. Um, they're really cute and I, th I thought that was really cute, but once I line up seven of them along this entire um, button band, it was just a little too much. It's a little overpowering. I think these are great, um, but I just don't think it's the right uh, uh, button for this sweater. So I had some of these little white, because they're kind of frosted buttons, and what I had originally hoped to find was something like this in a pink color that would go nicely with the sweater. There was a pale pink that was not, the shade wasn't right for this. And then there was a, a kind of a dark pink that was just, it was, the tone was just not right. I only had four of these. So I found some like this online. I don't know if they're exactly like this. So I bought enough to uh, fill up the whole band. So even if, if they aren't the same as this, I will have enough to do this. So I just thought a simple button uh, would work well for this. That's what I'm doing about the buttons. At least that's what I've decided at this point. So we'll see. I often change my mind multiple times with buttons. You never know until they actually get sewn on. Another thing I did that was a little different than what the patterns, uh, actually there's two things I did for the sleeve that were different. When you uh, are working a top-down sweater construction and you get to the underarm, you have all of these sleeve stitches. So you put them on waist yarn or some kind of a stitch holder, uh, and then you just continue with the body. But before you continue with the body, you need to cast on some stitches at the underarm to give some depth to the, or width to the sweater. And typically what instructions will tell you to do is however many stitches you cast on in order to work the body, they'll have you pick up that many in order to work the sleeve. 
and that usually results in some sort of hole at each end of the cast on where that cast on edge, the picked up stitches meet the existing live stitches that you put on waist yarn for the sleeve. So I use a technique that avoids that hole uh, and that was what this week's Technique Tuesday video was about. The other thing I did, and I think I just didn't read what the pattern said and it doesn't matter. This is like, this is just a completely personal choice. There's the decreases for the sleeve. You want them to be mirrored. You want one to lean in one direction and one the other, at least I do. And I think the pattern was having them lean uh, inward this way instead of outward that way. Uh, I just tend as a default to lean my increases and decreases toward the area that's changing in size. And since this is consistent uh, in the center, I tend to lean things in that direction. I will do it in the opposite direction for various reasons. Uh, and it's just what I did on the first sleeve without thinking, then I matched it for the second. Again, that's just a personal preference, but uh, it's something that I just did automatically. So one thing that I found a little puzzling about this particular chart was they it was that the designer kind of mixed uh, charting philosophies. So typically, when you do a knitting chart, if you are, are the the chart will represent what the work looks like when it's completed from the right side of the work. So this is supposed to represent what the right side of the work looks like. So these blank squares are all knits and this area here are all pearls. These are yarn overs, the so little eyelets. And anything that's angled like this is a decrease. So decreases tend to lean in one direction or another. So this is pretty typically a knit two together from a right side work. And I had to look at the key to see well, what did this triangle mean? And this is a wrong side row. And what it said was to purl two together uh, through the back loop. It's going to create on the right side of the work, it's going to create a decrease that actually leans to the left. It's going to lean in the opposite direction of this one. So I wasn't sure if that was what they really intended because then there's another decrease here. Did, did the designer intend to have the straight diagonal line or did they actually intend for things to go in the other direction? And then later in the pattern, the symbol is used again for working purl two together through the back loop on the right side of the work. So the designer used the symbol for the action, purl two together through the back loop, regardless of whether you were doing it on the right side of the work or the wrong side of the work. So that is not how you would typically present a symbol in this type of chart. So I recharted it with symbols I'm more accustomed to. So that section of the chart would look like this. So that on the right side of the work, you would have a right leaning decrease, and then you'd have a left leaning decrease, and then you'd have a right leaning decrease. And I looked at the close up photos of the designer's projects, and that was what she did. I, so I did some swatching to see if that was what I wanted to do or not. And I decided that I did not want to do that. And instead I wanted, this is that chart area represents this right here, that I wanted the edges of the stockinette to angle in, in the same direction. And then when you get to the top, you have one of the stitches uh, lies on top going to the left. It, did, it wouldn't ruin the project if I had done it as she did it. Clearly her projects look very nice and uh, I could have done it that way. I just preferred to have a more defined edge here than what she had stated. And I felt I needed to rechart it in a way that I was more accustomed to. And so then I, I gave myself a final chart that actually represented um, the result I wanted. So that meant on a right side row, I would work this as a knit two together. And on a wrong side row, this has worked as a purl two together. And that gives the same result on the right side of the work. Just like when you do a knit stitch on the right side of the work and a purl on the wrong side of the work, you get stockinette fabric. This type of idea where a symbol represents the same action, no matter if it's uh, the right side or the wrong side, is a type of, 
of charting philosophy that you do see, you just don't usually see it mixed with uh, the other kind of philosophy where one symbol represents two different actions depending on whether it's the right side of the work or the wrong side of the work. I have quite a few stitch dictionaries in my personal library that are from other countries in Europe and also some that are from Japan. And in this particular book, there are stitch patterns that are charted differently. And first of all, you can see that the symbols don't look exactly the same as what we might be used to here in the US. But this is a chart um, to create this work, this stitch pattern right here in the round. And so every, every round is worked from this direction. And this is a chart for the same stitch pattern, um, but it's charted uh, right side rows and wrong side rows instead. So typically when you have a chart that represents the right side of the work, you can use it for knitting in the round or knitting flat as long as you reverse the meaning when you are working wrong side rows. Um, but it will always represent what the right side of the fabric looks like so you can compare what you have to the chart and tell if you have made a mistake or not. Where with this kind of charting philosophy, you are basically given sequential actions to make and you don't necessarily have the context of the rows above and below to really tell if you are doing things correctly um, because the symbol represents what you are actually going to do, not what the work is going to look like on the right side. So I have this book on Estonian knitting. It's the second volume of Estonian knitting. This one focuses on socks and stockings. Most of the, of the charts in here are for in the round knitting, but the symbols um, that are used in these charts are, are still quite different from what we're used to. And so you'd need to get yourself familiar with this. But again, this is something that's in a book. And if I were going to use it, in a project that I was going to knit, I'd rechart it anyway, just so that I could have a separate piece of paper and wouldn't have to have the big book sitting on my desk all the time and I wouldn't have to carry it with me if I was going to be going somewhere else. So there are a lot of different ways of presenting uh, stitches and what we're used to in the US is only one way. These are these Austrian Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns. Uh, and they use other types of symbols too. So in here, the number eight represents a knit through the back loop. And then the arrow is showing that this is traveling over the top of the pearls. And so again, you have to get used to this kind of chart. And once again, because you might be using multiple charts from within a booklet that are on different pages, this is the kind of thing where I would just rechart everything so that as I was charting it, I would really look at it, make sure I understood what I was doing but then the chart that I created would be very easy for me to read because I'd be used to those symbols. This is yet another um, book on Bavarian Traveling Twisted Stitch Patterns. It's a three volume set and has a similar type of charting method as the one I just showed you, but instead of using the number eight to re represent a knit through the back loop, they've got the letter V. So a lot of this is, is because of what was available in typography when these were originally published. Uh, whereas today we've got software packages with all of these different symbol sets and you can just click on something in a menu of chart symbols and create a chart very, very easily. There's just a, an incredible difference. And if you've ever used a drops pattern, those are um, from Europe and they have yet another type of of charting system. So anytime you come across a, a new type of chart, it just takes a little bit of time to adjust to what it is. And then you might need to, or want to translate it into something that's easier for you to use while you're knitting. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.